How do you connect between biology and space? For me, as a young girl growing up, I used to see Cosmos by Carl Sagan, and I was fascinated by science fiction, whether books, Asimov, Heinlein, uh, Larry Neven, Star Trek, Star Wars, the works, I'm a complete geek, it's okay. I always wanted to reach space. It's an interesting thing. Space is a reoccurring theme throughout my life. I constantly was thinking about how can I reach space? How can I reach space? How can I be integrated into things happening in space? Uh, yesterday night, I was at this uh, TV studio and it was an historical moment. I couldn't believe I had the privilege of to be like televised on a landing on the moon. It's unthinkable when you come from the United States. People are very interesting. Yeah. Even if they are doing small time. Oh, it's no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's So. 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 <laughs> I need to practice my voice. That's true. That's true. Because you want to get to the end of the auditorium. End right? of the auditorium. <laughs> so what are you going to speak about? Sustainability and how, you know, space can help sustainability on Earth. So space exploration simulation on Earth are called analog mission. And what we do is that we mimic one or more conditions of a real space mission. So it could be an exploration on another planet space mission. It could be, oh, I'm just working on the International Space Station today, so I need to check my microgravity. It could be a research base on some place distant in the future or on the moon, and then you need to check, wait, what kind of food would be best for the astronaut? What is the psychology? What are the team dynamics? And you check all these things. A lot of um, technological and system integrations are being checked in analog missions. I think the more interesting question is how space simulation missions and space simulation ecosystem actually stays relevant for the new space. And for the new space uh, era. So some people, for instance, have now like astronaut training facilities and they do both space simulation missions there and, and train the people whether it's a zero g or a, or a pool you know that you put astronauts in like special suits and stuff but it's never a nasa accredited uh, training it's not a spacex accredited training program so i'm interested to hear how's that uh, gonna fall out education is a big thing in space simulation tourism is a big thing um, but you have to ask yourself, how do you maintain it to be relevant and accessible to people who really want to go to space and to the new space industry? I'm currently looking at what's happening with Axiom 1. Experiments over the last eight days. It was an aggressive schedule. Uh, fortunately, we were able to accomplish our objectives and hopefully it'll lead to some great groundbreaking research. And I'm saying, okay, so Axiom is sort of offering the real thing together with SpaceX and together with NASA, but what's the next move? So you're going to have a different space station. It's not going to be the ISS. But now they're having all these relationships with SpaceX and NASA. So the training goes from SpaceX and NASA. So where does these analog missions fit if they do? It's science, it's tech, it's education, it's outreach. It's a very rich platform and you do a lot of good things with it. I still have to hear about one platform provides tech that has been used later on in a space company or a methodology that is adopted from a space analog mission. Yeah, to... or else there's no point, right? I'm not so sure. So remember that I told you about these amazing people that get to this area and how amazing they are. We're talking highly skilled, highly professional people with a lot of passion, very creative, very, I don't know, like really out of the box thinkers, some of them. The area grows leaders, which doesn't okay. happen in other space companies. For okay. instance, if you're now an engineer or you just finished your engineering studies and then you go into work for SpaceX, you're not necessarily going to a leadership position. Yeah. But what's happening with the analog missions and simulation is that there's always like relatively small groups you have to do everything by yourself yeah and you have to make it work and it's all on you yeah and your team so you, you, gain, you gain more skills you have to be a leader you have to solve problems you have a lot of more room to be creative so there is a room there yeah to grow the next generation of space leadership but what i'm looking for is the, the link so it's it's obvious that it's a big place for inspiration for children teenagers you know the general public because it's accessible so much more accessible 
the real space. I think new space is fueling itself very well. Like people are using space tech and methodology and they're doing a really good work at it. It's just at a really high cost. So analog missions via NASA had analog missions for training astronauts, for instance, in cave exploration, yeah. living for two weeks in a Sicilian cave to work inside a closed environment where you're completely isolated from the environment. You need to work on safety protocols on your teammates. You need to watch yourself how psychologically you are, you know, yeah. influenced by it. You do some experiments. How, how do you, you know, mitigate that? You don't always have connections with your um, support, you know, mission yeah. control and support center. How do you do that? People go through a lot of training in different areas, like Project Nemo underneath the ocean, near Key Largo, yeah. and so on and so forth. So NASA has been using that, and been using those specific places to train their own astronaut. That's not available to the public. If your goal was to have more people from the public doing these kind of extreme stuff, then the question becomes questions of funding. Who's going to fund all these expeditions? And it's a big issue in analog missions. Nobody's funding them. People are funding themselves. If you want to say, no, I want to train the next generation of astronauts, that's really nice, but that's NASA already doing that. And SpaceX are very focused on uh, operational protocols, making sure whoever boards their dragon knows how to operate that dragon. ISS is now mostly NASA, so ISS is taking the part of training people for the ISS. And Axiom 1 is now, you know, in between making sure that everybody yeah. gets the full package. Let's talk about astronauts for a second and landing on the moon. So, mm -hmm. yeah. there, there's a... Artemis program? SLS, for all of its problems, is really not going to present as much of a barrier as many other issues. The main problem is the fact that NASA is not really getting ready to go back to the moon. We aren't training astronauts. We don't have anybody out of our latest crop of astronauts specifically assigned to the Artemis 3 mission. We should be training at this point to go back to the moon moon. I mean, the Apollo astronauts certainly were within three years prior to the 1969 Apollo 11 mission, and yet we don't seem to be doing that at the moment. With the moon, you're first going to have the Chinese there, not Americans, and they have been training and they're willing to probably make the leap better than the Americans at the moment. That's okay. That's their cultural Yes. Initiative, and that's amazing. But I'm talking about NASA. China is a black box for now. In NASA, they don't have the vehicle to land people on the moon. And they won't fly anyone until Starship is really ready and went through, you know, human test, like rigorous sure. testing for all the human risk factors during the flight to the moon. So when they had the moon program, it took several years. Yeah. But they had different vehicles. So now it's going to be a bit different. that they have at least five years to come up with a training program for Artemis, not two or three. And if that is indeed the case, Jim Bridenstine's assurances about going back to the moon by 2024 was nothing more than a bunch of hype. They don't want to fail with humans. That's they true. Want with the technology, and that's a big no-no. They do have all, those, all that knowledge that came from the Apollo program in the 1960s. When you're using a completely different methodology and technology, and they already submitted their report and they have been speaking about the moon for 80 years now, so yeah. all that knowledge is, is known. And those people were very sharp. Buzz Aldrin is still a very sharp person. Yeah. And they will have comments and they will include them as, you know, honorary advisors and things like that. But the tech is very different. The training methodology is going to be completely different. And the timeline is different. So I'm guessing they're going to put their foot down once the Chinese reach the moon. Yeah. And 
perfect yeah. training program. So it's psychology. Yeah, it's always psychology. NASA budget yeah. is political. So we're in Hawthorne. We're in Hawthorne. You see this? Yes. The tower? The, the tower. Yeah, that's, that's the rocket. That's the rocket. No, yeah. that's the first stage. Yeah, it's the first stage. Yeah. That's the SpaceX factory. This is it. So how many times have you been to the rocket? Once. Wow. That's going to be my second. Okay. You never asked to have a tour? You can't. I, I mean, I mean, you can. I just wouldn't know who to ask. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. I have to all this We're going to come back oh. walking. Okay. We're going to walk. Is it back. okay to walk and photograph everything? It's amazing. I am so glad that I can do this live stream. Like I said, last time I was here, they were like, no, no, you don't tell anyone what this road is, you don't talk about it, and so that's changed. Okay, let's see. Here's that ground level perspective for you. I'll take all the photos for you here, you know? Yeah, we have to, you have to stand across the street. No, no, no. In order to get the oh. perspective. Well, maybe. Look at that. What a company. something about the Russians. Yes, the Russians uh, started uh, many years ago to try and get this thing uh, to get higher thrust with using multiple engines. So this one is the 9 and the lucky is like we said on the on the heavy there's probably like what 32 or 28. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a rocket scientist so there you go. But the problem is that once you have so many multiple engines it's very hard to control the different uh, dynamics that go out from the nozzles. So it's actually a, a big issue and we'll see how you know the 28 or 32 Maybe they'll go even lower to get the higher thrust for a Starship, which is, you know, tons and tons and tons. Yeah, it's uh, massive, huh? Uh, massive. This is like a baby one. That's Falcon baby 9 one. is a baby one. Yeah. It's huge, but it's actually a baby one. So it's, it's very nice. I wish I could go into the hangar and into the, you know, yeah. facilities, but I wasn't able to get my access uh, approved. So there you go. This time. This time. Maybe next time. 